So we're really happy to have Allison Singer here today, who's the president of the Autism Science Foundation. So um, I do have a bit of an intro for her, because she's really a special guest for us. Um, so she's the co-founder and president of ASF, which is a nonprofit organization, which really is dedicated to funding innovative research and supporting the needs of people and families with autism. Um, you honestly couldn't craft a more impressive CV for Allison. So she graduated magna cum laude from Yale, earned her MBA from Harvard, and then really um, rose to the ranks at NBC. She was an intern um, during her um, undergraduate years and then rose up to being a VP at NBC. Um, lucky for us, she made a big transition in her career to becoming, um, uh, you know, uh, from a career standpoint, an autism advocate. Um, and really that was because she is the mother of a child with autism who actually now is 21 years old, and she's the legal guardian of a brother who has autism. So um, she, since 2007, Allison has held many really important leadership roles in addition to ASF in the autism um, community. So she serves on the Federal Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, the IACC, which really is charged with writing the annual strategic plan to guide federal spending on autism research. She serves on many executive boards, such as the Yale St Child Study Center, the Seaver Autism Center at Mount Sinai, the Marcus Autism Center at Emory, um, as well as the U University of North Carolina's Autism Research Center. She serves on the advisory board of the CDC Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, as well as the New York State Immunization Advisory Committee, very important role. Um, I, I've come to know Allison more recently, personally, through our role on the board of INSAR, the um, International Society for Autism Research, where she also is not only a board member, but she chairs the very important INSAR Communications Committee, which really guides um, INSAR's um, programs in communicating uh, research to the broader um, autism community. Um, for her incredible commitment to the field of autism research, Allison has received the 2012 AAP American County Pediatrics Autism Champion Award. And then just a couple of years ago, she um, was given the INSAR Outstanding Research Advocate Award. Just last year, she received the New York Families for Autistic Children Research Advocacy Award. Um, so, you know, when you look at the definition of advocate in Merriam-Webster, it says it's someone who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause. I would say that Allison has truly redefined the role of advocacy in autism. So she doesn't just support and recommend causes. She's actually, through her work in ASF and other areas, she's really pushed the envelope um, and moved the needle forward in terms of the um, way we use rigorous science to inform families and really um, help us use cutting edge science to change policy. Um, a, a lot of what ASF does is not just funding really, um, I, I'd say, evidence-based rigorous research, but they also communicate that science to families in a way that's digestible, understandable, and that helps um, communities be engaged in um, autism awareness. Um, I would really recommend actually going to the ASF uh, website. They have some really nice podcasts on just new studies that have come out in autism and really, again, making them digestible for families um, so that we can really start in a meaningful dialogue around um, autism research. So we're really, really excited to have her here today um, to share with, um, with us her insights um, from her many years of autism advocacy. So thank you, Alison. Thank you for that unbelievably flattering introduction, although I'm a little exhausted listening to all that work I have to do. <laughs> Um, as Shafali said, I think if you had told me back when I was in graduate school that one day I would be the founder and president of a nonprofit that focused on autism research, I would have thought you were crazy. It was not at all what I thought I would be doing with my life. I was really one of the only people I knew in college who knew exactly what she wanted to do. I always wanted to be a journalist. Um, I always wanted to work in television news, and that's what I became. I did everything that you need to do to become a journalist, working the overnight shifts, typing, typing, typing. Um, but, and, I, and I made myself a journalist, and I, I loved it. I loved working at NBC. But you know, life has a way of disrupting our, our best laid plans. And as Shafali said, that happened to me when my daughter was born. Um, and when she was eventually at age two diagnosed with autism. I was no stranger to autism when Jody was diagnosed, as, as Shafali said. Back in 1968, my older brother Stephen uh, was diagnosed with autism when he was four years old and I was two years old. 
Back then in the 1960s, there was no such thing as the Individuals with Disability Education Act. So there was no law that even enabled him to go to school or to receive any services or any treatments of any kind. My mother was told that his autism was her fault um, and that it happened because her first thought upon looking at him after she woke up from the anesthesia after giving birth was that he looked like a scrawny yellow chicken. So apparently that thought going through her mind was enough to cause my brother to retreat into the world of autism. Um, she was told that she was a refrigerator mother, too cold to care for my brother. And she was told she should try harder with the next child. Instead of being discouraged though, my mother looked for a scientific study that she could enroll my brother in to try to find some answers. But they were practically non-existent back in the 60s. Eventually, she did find a study of autism that was taking place at Bellevue Hospital in New York with Dr. Magda Campbell. Um, but one of the requirements for getting my brother enrolled in that study was that my mother had to agree to undergo Freudian psychoanalysis. Because think about it, they wanted to understand the causes of autism, and since autism was caused by mothers, they studied the mothers. So my mother accepted this incredible humiliation so that Stephen could be enrolled in this study for two years. And during those two years, he actually lived in the hospital at Bellevue. That's how studies were done then. Um, and then when the study ended, what I'm told is that Bellevue pulled a lot of strings to get him placed in the residential facility that was closest to where we lived in New York. And um, that was Willowbrook. So yes, that, that Willowbrook, the Willowbrook that has now become the symbol of the horrors of 1970s mental institutions. And every Saturday, we would go and visit my brother Stephen at Willowbrook. And visiting him mostly meant my sitting alone or with the other siblings in what they called the visitor's room, uh, where we would watch the static ridden black and white television that was mounted in the corner of the ceiling. And it was always tuned to Channel 9 in New York, which back in the 70s always was showing either a black and white Abbott and Costello film or the New York Mets. What I remember most about being there, though, is hearing moaning and screaming and the fact that it always smelled like ammonia. And after a few months of that, I begged my mother to let me take tap dancing lessons on Saturday with my friend Cheryl so that I wouldn't have to go uh, to Willowbrook anymore. And eventually, she relented. Um, I didn't have any idea at the time that she was already hard at work at trying to get my brother out of Willowbrook, which eventually meant that we needed to move out of New York City so that he could be placed in a different center uh, in Rockland County. And once that happened, uh, because of the stigma associated with autism in the 1970s, I just tried to push autism out of my mind. At the time, my mother said, um, it was our family's private business and not to talk about it. And um, so I just focused on trying to be a, a normal um, adolescent in Rockland County. Um, and I tried to continue to push autism as far out of my mind as I could until my daughter was born. So Jody uh, was born in 1997, and she had problems from birth. She wouldn't sleep. She rarely ate. She spent most of her time as an infant crying. She, as, as she got a little older, she showed no interest in the playground. She showed no interest in toys. And she really showed no interest in, in other toddlers. Um, she was diagnosed with failure to thrive, early colic, late colic, extreme colic. I've never seen colic like this. Um, and as she, as she got older, she started to play with toys in very strange ways. She would line them up. She would sort them by color. Um, I would try to use a spoon to try to feed a stuffed bear, and she would become obsessed with the tag on the bear that indicated the contents of the stuffing. I remember I asked my mother if Stephen ever behaved like this. 
And I was incredibly relieved when she said no. So I tried to stop worrying about autism. I, I ignored plenty of what we now know to be red flags. Motor delays, very, very limited smiling, no babbling, no pointing, no showing me toys, no waving bye-bye. When I called her name, she would never respond, but I knew that her hearing was fine because if I turned the television on and she heard Elmo, she would come running. When Jody's preschool teacher told me that she would have to leave our synagogue preschool and that we should call early intervention, I was heartbroken and distraught and I used words that don't belong in any preschool, for which I later apologized. <laughs> um, when eventually Jody was diagnosed with autism by several leading specialists, I was not happy with one. I took her for multiple diagnoses just to, just to make sure, uh, including finally Omiclin at Yale. Um, I finally accepted the diagnosis, but I was, I was devastated. Um, my mom and I were both hysterical because for us, autism meant these horrific memories of Willowbrook, and we thought that's what that's what life had in store for her. But fortunately, things had improved significantly since the 1960s. Every state is now required to provide early intervention services, and Jody had 40 hours of state-of-the-art, evidence-based evidence applied behavior analysis for several years. Like all of the other autism moms, or most of the other autism moms, I quit my job and I anointed myself the CEO of Jody Incorporated. I was absolutely determined. Um, I had heard from um, many sources that um, active parents was a leading driver uh, in recovery of children, and I was determined that Jody was going to have everything she needed. So I, I bought materials, I put them in the clear boxes so she could see inside them but would have to use her language or gestures to try to get at them. I labeled everything in the house, I relabeled them, I monitored her progress, I organized her toys, I saved her favorite activities uh, like visiting the puppies at Petco or at the ASPCA as rewards for her to use for her token economy. I, I took data, I tallied data, I fought constantly with the insurance company, I attended meeting after meeting after meeting. And by the time three years of this intensive work had passed um, and we were ready to take her for retesting, I was sure that they were going to tell me that she had made enough progress that she could be mainstreamed for kindergarten. To me, I could see that she had certainly made improvements, but unfortunately, the results of that testing showed that she actually made very minimal gains and uh, would not be able to qualify for mainstream kindergarten. Um, as you may be able to tell from this description, Jody was and continues to be extremely challenged by her autism. Uh, between kindergarten and ninth grade, she was in six different schools. She, she definitely has made progress over the years. She has gained some language, and I know that she understands more than she says. The only other child she ever showed any interest in was her sister. She rarely sleeps more than two or three hours a night, and she is very prone to wandering and needs constant 24-7 supervision. Worst of all, she tends to be self-injurious, and I promise you there is really nothing on earth that's worse than watching your child peel the skin off her arm or bang her head against the wall. But the stories do get better with time. Stephen turned 54 this year, and he is now living in a group home in Suffern with four other men with autism. They deliver meals on wheels three mornings per week, and we continue to try new interventions to teach him to talk because my belief is that the learning window never closes. Jody, who's now 21, recently moved to a residential placement in the Catskills in New York called the Center for Discovery, which is a farming community uh, for people with autism and other types of disabilities. And there, she is doing what she loves. She's raising animals. 
um, mostly pigs. Every Jewish mother's dream. <laughs> but, but being with animals is no longer her reward for work well done. Now it is her work well done. She gets up early in the morning to feed the baby goats bottles of milk. She collects, washes, and sorts eggs. She feeds the chickens. She's got scars on her calves from the pecking to prove it. She slops the pigs. She measures their food. She measures their water. And she will sit for hours on end providing love and comfort to animals when they are sick. She has certainly turned her lifelong love of animals into a real vocation. And one of my favorite um, stories about Jody's work is when I wanted to bring her home uh, for Passover last year, we were told that she couldn't leave uh, at that time in the spring because that's when the lambs were born. Like, who knew that that's, I didn't know that lambs are always born in the spring. But I have to tell you, it was one of my proudest moments when I announced to my family at the Seder that Jody couldn't join us because she had to work. <laughs> couldn't get off work. And just like when I was a child, we go and we visit Jody every Saturday. Uh, but that's where the similarities of visiting a residential center stop. Jody lives in an amazing community. There is well-trained, loving staff, and her house smells like nail polish, not ammonia. She lives with four other young women uh, who have autism, and she has finally made her first friend. At 20 years old, Jody finally made a friend. She and uh, her friend Jamie, neither one of them speaks, but they will seek each other out. They will, uh, Jody will go and sit on Jamie's bed and they will play on their iPads at the same time. And sometimes they will brush each other's hair. Um, and in their house, they don't have to watch Abbott and Costello, they don't have to watch the New York Mets because they just got a wee fit. <laughs> And likewise, my brother is in the best situation of his life, in a home with caring support staff, meaningful work delivering meals on wheels, and same-aged disabled peers, many of whom share his love of jigsaw puzzles, and with whom he is able to comfortably interact. And yet, despite these gains, both Jody's and Stephen's futures are under threat this time because of misguided regulations from Medicaid, the public insurance program here in the US that covers most residential care for people with disabilities. New Medicaid regulations threaten to shut down intentional communities and disability-specific housing settings, like the ones that Stephen and Jody live in, because some believe they are not integrated enough into the community. Literally thousands of people could be ripped from residences that they love and where they are happy and thriving. And others will not be able to choose to live in these types of communities, even though it may be what they want, and it may be what is best for them, given their needs. I know we all bristle at the word institution. I especially do, having witnessed Willowbrook firsthand. But today's residential settings are nothing like Willowbrook. Disability-specific housing is a critically important option. In fact, it may be the only option for people whose care needs are 24-7, who have constant seizures, who have elopement issues, and who have self-injurious behaviors. Individuals with disabilities have a civil right to choose how and where they want to live, just as we all do. Some may not choose using language because they don't have language, and so we have to look for nonverbal signals. In my daughter's case, for example, I can see it in how happy she looks, in the fact that she's always eager to go back to her job and back to her house. I can see it in the fact that she's made friends with the other girls who live in her house. I can see it in the fact that everyone who goes to visit her remarks to me on how happy she seems in this new setting. And I also see it in the fact that because she's so comfortable there, we've been able to dramatically reduce her anxiety medication. 
Perhaps one of the reasons that the Medicaid law regulations have become so convoluted is because the word autism has become so convoluted. Autism used to mean something very specific. Until we moved to DSM-5, autism described a consistent cluster of symptoms. But today, the phrase autism spectrum disorder has become such a big tent term that the people under that tent often have very little in common with each other. Autism can mean genius IQ, or it can mean IQ under 50. Autism can mean highly verbal, or it can mean nonverbal. It can mean graduating from Harvard Law School, or it can mean exiting from high school with a certificate of attendance. It can mean self-injury, sleep disorder, aggression, pica, biting, wandering, or not. Thanks to decades of research by people in this room and elsewhere, we know that autism encompasses core symptoms that are present in each person who is diagnosed, but the abilities of those individuals that are vastly different. If we are going to be able to personalize our approach to care and provide benefits to all people, we need terminology and language that are specific and meaningful. In fact, the move to DSM-5 was actually supposed to do this. It was supposed to provide greater specificity so that the diagnosis would point towards potential services. But because of the way DSM-5 is being applied, the opposite has actually happened. Everyone is lumped together as having ASD. To the broader public, not so familiar with autism, the word autism has come to describe the more traditionally skilled, visible, higher functioning end of the spectrum, because those individuals are able to have a voice, to represent themselves at meetings, and to appear in the media. Television shows like The Good Doctor and Atypical are broadcasting this brand of autism to the world. And the result is that autistic people with the most challenging behaviors are becoming invisible. They are being left behind. Many of them cannot speak for themselves, and so this task falls to their parents and family members. But in fact, in my opinion, the basic civil rights of some people with autism are not being protected because the abilities and disabilities of each end of the spectrum are clashing putting parents and caregivers at odds with those people with autism who do have the ability to advocate for themselves, who can live independently, gain a competitive employment, and ultimately lead independent lives. This problem with nomenclature is a disservice to both ends of the spectrum and to everyone in the middle. It makes research much more challenging and several self-advocates with whom I've discussed this issue have recounted to me how hard it was for them to access services because they don't appear to be disabled. The reality is that the current use of word autism may unintentionally be depriving many people of the attention, supports, and help that they need because of this lack of specificity. Research has revealed to us how incredibly heterogeneous autism is, and to continue to use a single word to describe it is a disservice to the knowledge that we have gained over the past many years, and a disservice to the people with autism whom we love. So what can those of you who are here today do about this? Glad you asked. <laughs> First, to those of you who are scientists and clinicians. The recent trends in autism research have been focusing on higher functioning individuals. It's easier to get them into the scanner. It's easier for them to provide consent. These are what I hear from, from scientists. Um, and studies have focused on helping these individuals find employment, for example, or helping them to improve their social skills. But my challenge to you is to remember those who can't advocate for themselves and that for every person with autism who is out there looking for a job, there is a person who is struggling to get through the day without ripping the skin off of her arm. 
please remember this hidden horde of people with autism, like my daughter, and fight for them too. Include them in your research and include them in your advocacy. They deserve it. What else can clinicians and scientists do? I know that you are all very busy, but please try to take the time to answer questions that families and patients have. Help us to coordinate care. Spend time with the families who are enrolled in clinical trials and help them try to understand the data that you are collecting. I know that this is not always possible, but in many cases, the most successful researchers are those who take the time to get to know their research participants as everyday people. These bonds will help ensure that families don't drop out of studies and that they will enroll in future studies as well. And these relationships may help you as scientists and clinicians to recognize new variabilities or to hear from families about behaviors or triggers or other experiences that may, that may provide new insights into your own research. I also believe that every autism scientist, particularly those who are doing basic research in autism, should try to spend some time in the clinic and with families with autism. Autism is about people. Yes, it's also about genes and cells and circuits and mice and rats, but at the end of the day, the goal of all of this research should be about improving the real lives of real people. Go to an autism event where our families gather. I promise you they will be thrilled to see you there. In fact, the Autism Science Foundation is now requiring in our grant contracts that our grantees present their data at parent conferences or that they go and meet with families at autism events. These events are often also a great opportunity for you to meet with new families and tell them about the work you're doing and invite them to participate in new studies. And speaking of studies, we need to work together as advocacy groups and as scientists to encourage our families to participate in research. Some of our own research at the Autism Science Foundation has been looking at why the rate of participation in autism research lags behind those of other pediatric disease groups. The good news is that the barriers seem to be structural, not philosophical. Families aren't telling us they don't believe in research or they don't uh, want there to be advances in research. They tell us that they drop out of studies because they had to park too far away from the clinic. Or there wasn't babysitting available for their other children whom they had to bring to the appointment. Or that they had to wait around for a long period of time in the clinic, that the, the uh, researchers were not ready to get to work with their children when they arrived. They tell us the receptionist had no idea why they were there. Or they say they dropped out because they didn't want to have to take their children out of school and that no weekend appointments were available. We can fix these things. These are, I was actually happy that these were the issues because we can, we can offer families snacks. I, we can encourage all of the center directors to give up their parking space in front of the clinic and instead put up a sign that says, reserved for families participating in clinical trials. We can inform the receptionist at the front of the building about who's coming and why they're coming so that those families can be properly welcomed and made to feel special and important. At the very least, everyone should know why they're there. I also hope that scientists and clinicians will consider supplementing your science journal reading by reading some of the books and blogs that parents are reading. When I first entered the autism community, all of the moms were told to read a book called Let Me Hear Your Voice. This book brought tremendous hope to many families. It was one of the first books that encouraged families to seek evidence-based treatments, specifically applied behavior analysis. Through these books and these blogs that parents are reading, we are learning the vocabulary of autism. And parents will use this vocabulary when they come to your clinic. 
it's, it's from these books that we learn to spell words like risperidone and fluvoxetine and to ask you about them. Reading what we are reading can only help you be better prepared. In fact, a new book that was just published about a year ago is sort of a, an up-to-date, let me hear your voice. It's called um, Ketchup is My Favorite Vegetable, and it's written by Leanne Carter. Leanne is a wonderful writer. She's, she's written many novels and memoirs. She has a 25-year-old son named Mickey. And let me, and um, Ketchup is My Favorite Vegetable is the story of Mickey, who is an amazing young man. And the memoir is a beautifully written, very poignant account of the ups and downs of her family's life with autism, including her experience participating in research studies. Another great book uh, is In a Different Key, which is written by ABC News journalist John Donovan and journalist autism mom Karen Zucker. This book traces the social history of autism and autism advocacy and recounts the struggle that parents have had fighting for a place in the world for our children. This book also takes the issue of neurodiversity head on and argues that all people with autism, not just those who can advocate for themselves, need to have a voice at the table. And finally, I would urge you to be patient with families. The pace of research can feel very slow to families. We won answers yesterday. And because of that, we can often come across as impatient, discouraged, hostile, not always using the nicest words. But this is simply because we love our children so much. So I hope that you will keep that in mind if you ever uh, become angry with uh, how we as parents sometimes behave. And please keep in mind that parents have played a critical role in research advocacy over the past 15 years. And that because of that advocacy, children today get earlier, more precise diagnosis, more effective treatments, and have more evidence-based options. It was parents who lobbied for the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which guarantees individuals with, with disabilities the right to a free and appropriate education. It was parent advocacy groups like CAN, Cure Autism Now, and NAR, the National Alliance for Autism Research, that were the driving forces behind the Combating Autism Act of 2006, which nearly doubled NIH funding for autism research. And now the reauthorized version of that law, called the Autism Cares Act, directs the National Institutes of Health to spend approximately $160 million a year on autism research, which is unfortunately still far less than other childhood diseases, but a far cry from where we were just 10 years ago. In closing, I just want to remind you that we are all in this together. Clinicians, researchers, scientists, and advocates, we all have the same goals to improve the lives of people with autism. Although the progress can feel slow and the data sometimes can feel frustrating, when I actually look back over the past five to 10 years, the pace of progress has truly been remarkable. And when I think about how far we have come from the time that my brother was diagnosed in 1968 to the present day, it really is tremendous scientific and social progress. And for that, I thank all of you. To the scientists who are here, thank you for choosing this line of work and for all the long hours that you will put in, for the frustration you will experience, for the endless grant applications that you will sweat over, and for the ornery stressed out parents that you will encounter. We may not always express our appreciation but as parents, we are incredibly grateful for the important work that you have chosen to do. And to the individuals with autism and family members who are here today, please keep sharing your experiences. We have a very important role to play in making sure that research is real world focused. So thank you for attending events like this, 
for talking with scientists and clinicians, and for making sure that your personal experiences and your voices are heard. And now I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs>